It's called the five uh, love languages. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it just, it's just a great book, and uh, some of you may have heard about it, and uh, we actually use this book as part of our premarital counseling for couples planning to get married and just help them to kind of, we use the teaching from this book, which is really, really good. Uh, in fact, the entire uh, teaching is based on, this, on the premise that love has got a language, and that language may be different to different people. So what means love to me could be totally different from what means love to someone else. So my love language could be different to someone else's love language. So let's say if uh, my love language is words of affirmation, it would pretty much mean that uh, if, if, De, if for me to feel love, when Debbie says nice things to me, when she encourages me, when she, when she just kind of blesses me through words, I feel really love. And because that's my love language, I assume that that's got to be everybody's love language. Because that's the thing that makes me feel love, I would automatically assume that that's the thing that makes Debbie feel loved as well. So... I'd be going to her and saying nice things to her, you know, and blessing her with words and encouraging her. And at the end, she could turn to me and say, you know what, I don't feel like you love me. <laughs> and I'd go, why? I love you. You know, I, I say all these things. I'm constantly telling you how much I love you. And she said, no, no, you know, I just don't feel love. And, and that's simply because she has a different love language from me. So her love language could be uh, acts of service. So acts of service meaning like she, she, would, she would really feel love if I did nice things for her. Constantly, you know, like just helping her around the house, doing nice things for her, and that would make her really feel love. That is her love language. So she would assume that that's my love language as well. So she would think, because that made her feel love, she'd be doing nice stuff for me, doing a lot of work around the house and all that kind of stuff, and, and thinking that that's expressing love to me, but I would be like, you know, I don't feel like you love me. And it's not because that we don't love each other or we are not expressing love to each other. It's simply because, that, because we have different love languages. Love language. So that entire book is based on that whole idea that different people have different love languages. So what he does is he challenges couples, uh, married couples, to actually discover what the love language of your spouse is and express love to that person in their love language, not your own love language. And you won't believe it, but this simple teaching has saved like thousands and thousands of marriages, marriages on the verge of divorce, have just totally come, out from the, come, come back from that brink simply because they understood something and they discovered something new. The problem wasn't that they didn't love each other. The problem was they were just communicating love to each other differently. So when they understood each other's love language, in fact, there's a little quiz that we get couples to do that helps you discover what your primary love language is, what your love language is. And when you discover your love language, you share it with your spouse. This is my love language and the spouse. Now my, I have to start doing acts of service so that Debbie will feel loved. <laughs> Trying very hard with that one, but uh, yeah. So why am I talking about love languages? Because it, it's simply because this whole idea had got me to thinking or wondering if God has got a love language. What is the thing that makes God see or, I don't know if I should say feel, but just so that you understand what I'm saying, what would make God feel loved? What would God consider as an expression of love from us to Him, from mankind to Him? And it's important that we get this because someone came and asked Jesus, Master, what is the greatest commandment? Because they had a lot of com commandments back then. This was before the New Covenant and uh, they had so many things they needed to do and not do, follow, don't follow, and stuff like that. So he, he, he comes and asks uh, Jesus, says, Master, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says this to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
on these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. So he says, these are the greatest commandments. If you get these two right, everything else will fall into place. It will just happen naturally. This is the foundation on which everything else is built. You see, so I, when you read that, you know, I want to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. I want to love the Lord my God. But what can I do or what would be considered as an expression of my love to God? So I looked through the Bible and I came across this bunch of scriptures and I said, wow, Jesus does have a love language. He makes it very clear. He's explicit about it. The one thing that he considers as an expression of our love for him. And it's here in John chapter 14, verse 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Verse 23, Jesus answered them and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. John 15 verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command or if you keep my words or if you keep my commandments. What this, these verses are saying is Jesus has, does have a love language and he reveals it as this. If you are walking in obedience to my word, then that is an expression of your love for God. Amen? So if Jesus has a love language, that's what it is. Our love manifesting itself through obedience to His Word. So what Jesus is saying is, you know, if you love me like you say you do, if you love me like you sing you do, if you love me like you express and you cry that you do, it will be manifested in you walking in obedience to my Word. That is His love language. Amen? His primary love language. And people don't like messages like this. They say, you know what? Tell me about how much God loves us. You know, Clarence, tell me about grace and how He forgives us. Don't talk to us about obedience. Tell us about how no matter what we do, He doesn't count our sins against us. You know, He loves us. You know, He will never leave us nor forsake us. You know, give us, give us messages like that. You know, we all like messages like that, and all that is true. And this message by, by no means negates all those realities. But there comes a time in your Christian walk where you must ask yourself this question, what does all that, what does this great love that Jesus has for me mean to me? How, what can I do in response to such a great love, to such a great forgiveness, to all this grace that has been poured out upon me? What can I do in response to that? We all must ask ourselves that question at some point. What is the part? What is our part in this whole thing? What can we do? And he says, to those who love me, he will keep my commandments or keep my words. And before you panic and, you know, start feeling all condemned and judged, you know, just, just hear out the whole sermon and you'll be blessed by the end of it. A couple of things you need to get when you read the scriptures, a couple of things you need to understand. And the first one is this. It, it, this has nothing to do with God's love for you. It has absolutely nothing to do. You need to read this right. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He doesn't say, if you want me to love you, you must keep my commandments. Because a lot of people will read it that way. Because, you know why, they, they see love, or they think God loves the same way that they love. Because the way we love people is very performance-based. If the person whom we love or the person whom our love is directed towards, if they do well, we love you. We love you, you know, we appreciate you. But if they don't do well, they hurt us, you know, I don't love them anymore, you know, I'm angry with them. And sometimes we can carry that same performance-based kind of thing, uh, love, in our relationship with God. When we pray, uh, praying and we ask God to answer our prayers, it's great. 
when God answers our prayers and everything is going, but all of a sudden something doesn't go the way we want it, we don't get that job, we don't get that prayer answered, we start to get angry with God. Because our love can be very performance-based. So we think God loves that same way. God loves us based on our performance. So we would read something like this. We think, you know what? If I do well, God loves me. If I fall, if I stumble, if I make a mistake, God's going to be angry with me. So we read it like this. If you want me to love you, you will keep my commandments. This has absolutely nothing to do with God's love for you because God has already decided that He loves you. God had already decided that He loved you and He's already done the ultimate expression of His love for you in John 3, 16. For He so loved the world, for He so loved you, that He gave His only Son to die so that you can have eternal life, so that you can have peace, so that you can inherit heaven. He, God has already given you the ultimate expression of His love. That is settled. That is settled. God's love for you is certain nothing, nothing, nothing can change that. Nothing can change that. It had nothing to do with your performance. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrated His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, while we were unable to perform, while our performance was bad in the negatives, He sent His Son to die for us. So His love for us has nothing to do with our performance. And that is one thing we've got to know. We've got to have that settled in our spirit, in our hearts, in our minds. God's love for me cannot change. You've got to be convinced of that fact because that is the one thing the devil will try to convince you otherwise. That God's angry with you, that you're not good enough for God. You've got to be convinced. That's why Paul says that I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Not death, not life, not angels, not demons, not fears about today or worries about tomorrow. He says, not even the powers of hell can separate me from the love of God. He says, no power in the earth below or the sky above. Nothing in all creation can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We have got to be convinced of that. So this is not about God's love for you. That is settled. That is a done deal. This is about our love for God. This is about our response to such great a love. This is about our response to this great grace that has been poured out onto us. So I live my life a certain way. I choose to live my life in obedience to God's Word, not because I want His love, I want His acceptance, and I want His, His approval. I choose my life to live a certain way because I am accepted, I am loved, I am approved. That is the difference. That is the difference. The motivation changes. We are not doing things to get God's love. We are doing things because we are loved by God. That's the difference between the Old Testament law, living under law and living under grace. The motivation is totally different. So it's not about getting God to love you. He already loves you. That's why Jesus prayed that they may know that you love them as much as you love me. The Father loves you as much as He loves His Son. Can I... Can I just have a show of hands. Is that settled? Are you convinced that God loves you? Amen. Amen. Some still not convinced. Never mind. We'll pray for you later. <laughs> Another thing we need to note about before we go into this. Jesus isn't saying, if you love me, keep the law. He isn't saying that. He's saying, he who loves me will keep my commands, will keep my words. He isn't talking about the Old Testament law, okay? He's speaking, this is speaking about the teachings of Jesus, the commands of Jesus, and there are many. There are many. Uh, scriptures like in John 13, A new commandment I give to you, that you may love one another as I have loved you, that you also love another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, you have loved one another. 
Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's also a command of Jesus. And I'll give you just a summary of the different commands of Jesus that you can find in the gospel. He, he tells us to repent. He tells us not to be troubled. He asks us to follow Him. He asks us to rejoice. Let our light shine. To be reconciled. To not commit adultery. To, keep, to be people who keep our word. To go the extra mile. To love our enemies. To lay up treasures in heaven. To seek first the kingdom of God. To not be people who judge. Don't throw pearls before swine. He has to ask, seek, knock. Do unto others. He has to choose the narrow way, to pray, to fear God, to take His yoke upon us, to honor our parents, to deny ourselves. He asks us to forgive offenders, to beware of covetousness, to honor marriage, to lead by being a servant, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God, to love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, to love your neighbor as yourself. He asks us to be born again, to be baptized, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. He has to feed His sheep, to make disciples teaching disciples to obey, to receive. He asks us to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive God's power. So there are many commands of Jesus that are in the Bible. And He says, if you love me, you will obey my command. If you love me, you will obey my words. And some of you may be wondering, but isn't that just like, you know, uh, what's expected under the law? Isn't that like telling us to live by... Jesus commands, isn't that like telling us to go back to the law? Short answer for that is no. But let me take you in a little bit deeper. And by the end of this point, you, this scripture won't look so intimidating to you anymore. So the scriptures say in verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Whoever has my commandments keeps them. He it is who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. The first thing you need to notice is this. Loving Jesus and keeping His commandments is not, on the, it's not the same thing. He's not saying keeping my commandments equals loving me. Loving Jesus precedes keeping his commandments, and keeping His words. It gives, loving Jesus gives, or gives rise to keeping His commandments and keeping His words. So keeping His word is a result of loving Him. It's not the same as loving Him. Okay, I'm going to break it down a little further, make it really simple. Let's say someone comes and sees me and says, you know, Clarence, I want to get a tan. You don't see much of that in Malaysia, but you know, if you go overseas, you'll see just loads of people lying around in the sun for some reason. I'm sure you see a lot of that in Australia. If you, you know, Clarence, I want to get the tan. A tan, not a tan. Tan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I tell, and I tell this person this. If you spend time in the sun, you will get a tan. If you spend time in the sun, you will get a tan. So this person wants to get a tan. What should this person's focus be? His efforts, his focus should be on spending time in the sun, right? So you hang on to that thinking. Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. So now you have a desire to walk in obedience to God, right? You have a desire to walk in obedience to God's Word. You want your life to be a reflection of His goodness. You know, everyone would see you and will see Christ in you. That is your desire, right? And then you, you look through the Scriptures, how do I do this? I want to glorify God in my life. And you look through the Scriptures and you come across these this, this verses that say, you know, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Whoever has my commandments keeps them. He loves me. Whoever loves me keeps my word. Whoever does not love me doesn't keep my word. And say, you know, Jesus, I want to love you. You know, I want to prove to you that I love you, so I want to keep your commandments. I want to walk in obedience to your word. So you're reading about the commandments of Jesus and you get, okay, must forgive my enemies. Oh, try to forgive this person. It's so hard. I've got to forgive. Jesus said, forgive. 
bless those who curse you. Forgive, trying hard not to slap his face. <laughs> and, you're, and, you know, and you're just going on, oh. And Jesus says, you know, bless them. Oh, okay, I have to bless them some more. And, you know, and you're like, but God, I want you to know that I love you. That, you know, I want to do this so that, you know, I will love you. You know, and, and, and you know, oh no, lustful thoughts. I'm not supposed to have lustful thoughts. What a hurrah, bara, 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 bara. Don't think, don't think, hurrah, bara, bara. Oh, I don't want to think I don't have last full thought. And you're trying and you're suffering and you know, and you're trying to keep his commandments and you keep falling and you keep failing and you're wondering, oh, this is impossible. What's going on? It's not happening. And then you end up feeling condemned. You end up feeling guilty. The enemy comes and tells you, I told you you're not good enough. And you think, you know what? Because I cannot keep his commandments, it must mean that I don't love him. Oh my God, I'm an embarrassment. I'm a disgrace. God must be totally pissed with me. So now, you know, I just, just give it up altogether. Stop coming to church. Stop reading the Bible. Stop praying. And end up totally backslidden. Why? Because you've been trying to achieve the end, you got to remember this hand, right? Without the means, right? You've been focusing on the wrong things. If you want to get a tan, spend time in the sun. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The focus should not be on trying to keep His commandments, the focus should be on developing and building your intimacy and your love for Jesus. Amen? So this is how it should read. If you love me, the result will be, the natural outflow of that would be, you will keep my commandments. If anyone spends time in the sun, the natural thing that will occur because of that is they will get a tan. So going back to my example, going back to the scriptures again, and I'm going to use my tan and sun thing to compare, to give you a, a, a nicer picture of what's going on. Verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Going back to my analogy, if you spend time in the sun, you will get a tan. Verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Whoever has the tan has been spending time in the sun. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. If anyone spends time in the sun, he will have a tan. <laughs> Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Whoever has not been spending time in the sun will not be getting a tan. <laughs> Isn't that liberating? Come on, man. So Jesus is actually saying, if you love right, you will live right. You cannot live right if you don't Love right, that's right. Now, if you've been struggling to break habits, things that you've been walking with and struggling with, strongholds, and you've been trying to walk in obedience to what Jesus has commandment, commanded you, and you've been failing miserably, I want to invite you to take your focus off trying to live life, live the life according to it, trying to fulfill His commands, and take your focus and your energy and put it on developing your love for Jesus. You know, when, when I under, understood this, I thought, wow. Because there I was, some time ago, trying to, trying to do the right thing, trying to behave right, trying to talk right, trying to act right. And I had all these habits and things that I was struggling to, you know, and I was constantly feeling guilty, constantly falling short. When I understood this, I decided, you know what? I'm going to take all my effort and energy and shift it into my relationship with Jesus. So I decided to focus on developing my intimacy with Jesus, spending more time with Him, 
loving Him, meditating on His love for me, daily spending time with His Word, mixing around with the right people who will help fuel that flame of love that I have for Him, mixing people like iron sharpers iron. And when that happened, when without even realizing it, these other things that I was trying to do, trying to get rid of, those things just started falling off. Falling off. When I went back to those things, knock, knock, who's there? No one was there. No one was there. Why? Because if you love Him, the natural outflow of that was you will start to live your life in the right way and it would not be a struggle anymore. You see, that is what the enemy does. When the enemy wants, you see, sin has got a pattern. The sin has got a starting point. When the enemy wants you to go or to live a life of sin, he doesn't come with you with the sin. Hey, come, come and live this life. Very nice, very nice. Because you know, no way. What he does is, he affects, he gets you to break your intimacy or your relationship with God. You start to cut down on your prayer time. You start, he keeps you busy. You start to cut down on your word time. You stop hanging around with the right people. And then the result of that is, slowly you start to deteriorate as in your life. You start to do things that you shouldn't do. That's how the devil works. He knows if I can break this person's, if I can cause this person's heart to grow cold towards God, that's all I need to do. Try to put a wedge in that relationship, in that love relationship that God and He shares. Try to draw Him away and His heart can be stolen. The story of the prodigal son is so interesting because the son didn't leave the father's house because he had a lifestyle of sin. The son left the father's house and ended up in a lifestyle of sin. Right? So the son left the place of intimacy with the father, the place of closeness with the father. The son left, the, left that place where he could hear the father's voice, where he could receive the father, where he could commune with the father. He left that place and the natural result of it was he ended up in a lifestyle of sin and he ended up losing everything. But the good news is there's a father who's always waiting in open arms for you to come back to that place of intimacy, to that place of hearing His voice, to that place of closeness, to that place of love. Some of you have been carrying that guilt of falling short of God's expectations. You read the Bible and you think, you know what, I've been falling short, I can't, you know, I don't even feel worthy enough to be here. You have been focusing on the wrong thing. Start focusing on building and developing your relationship with Jesus. And all these things will, fall, will follow. Amen? And, it, and like every love relationship, it has to be worked on. It has to be worked on. It doesn't just happen naturally. It has to be worked on. There are some efforts that you have got to take. And I'm not just going to leave you like that. Next week, my favorite preacher is going to be doing the second part of this message on how you develop that love for Jesus. None other than Pastor Debbie. But now going back to the scriptures again, if you love me, God's love language, you will keep my commandments. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. Do the scripture look or sound as scary to you as it first sounded when I first read it now? Not at all, right? Not at all, right? So it's time for us to start developing our love and our relationship with Jesus. That's what it's all about. It is all about Him. It is all about Him. He's got so much for you. 
The enemy has been lying to you for too long. Enemy has been keeping you away from intimacy with the Father, and you are trying to get your life in order. You're trying to get your commandments, you know, right, and then go back to the house. That's never going to happen. You need to come back into the loving arms of the Father and let Him fix your life. Amen? Come on, let's stand. You know, I want to make an invitation to you if, you know, you've been far away from God. If you're here and you've been feeling guilty, the devil has been, you know, using things from your past, from your life, things that are going on daily to condemn you, to make you feel this constant sense of unworthiness that you don't belong here, that you don't belong in the presence of God. And, you, and that thing has been keeping you further and further. When you come to church, it's just like a ritual. I just got to do this on Sunday. Like, the, like that son who left the father's house and he ended up in a lifestyle of sin. But the moment he made that decision, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go home. Everything changed. There's a father that's waiting for you with open arms. Come back. Have you, are you tired of carrying heavy loads, heavy burdens? Come back. Come back into the loving arms of the Father. You know, if you're here and you've been far from God, today, Jesus is making that invitation or sending out that invitation to you. Come back. I'm waiting for you. Don't wait till you're good enough because you cannot do it without His help. You need Him. You need Him. If that's you, I just want you to lift your hands to God right now. Wherever you're standing, just lift your hands to God. Hallelujah. Lord, even right now, as hearts have been set right, hearts are returning to You, O Lord coming back to the home of your father. You know, don't feel condemnation when the son came back. You know, the son thought, you know, he had to say all these things to the dad to try to get things right, to say things right. The father would not have any of it. All he did was hug him and instantly reinstate and restore him to that place of sonship. Whatever mess he was in, the father covered it with a new and clean robe. Right now, feel that new and clean robe coming over you. As your heavenly father puts his arms around you and says, Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. Come. Come into the house. Let us celebrate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, even as hearts have returned today, Father, we thank you that there is much, there is much, there is much rejoicing in heaven, O Lord, Father. There is much rejoicing in heaven, O Lord. Lord, I pray that even from this day forth, Lord, your people, Lord, will focus on loving you, Lord. On focus on your great love for them, O oh Lord. Will focus, O oh Lord, on the things that matter most, O oh Lord, in your in their relationship with you, O oh Lord, Father. And those things, O oh Lord, will start to fall into place in their life, O oh Lord. Those strongholds will fall off. Even right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that strongholds are being broken. Scales are falling off eyes right now. Hearts are being opened right now. As Holy Spirit, you do what only you can do, O oh Lord. We give you praise and glory, Lord. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's give a clap offering to God.